So, I finished God of War Ragnarok pretty recently, and in trying to collect my thoughts to write a well put together critique, I realised that I wasn't really sure what my thoughts on this game were. And so it felt right to sit down and do a video similar to what I did with The Last of Us Part 2 when that came out, which is a video where I try to come to terms with the story experience of the game. So there will be full spoilers for God of War Ragnarok in this video, so if you don't want the game spoiled, you should definitely leave now. Get the f*** out. Now this is not some sort of critique video. Anything I say in this video that's positive or anything I say in this video that's negative is not set in stone. It's not an opinion I am married to. It's just me trying to come to terms with the way I feel about this game. And so I'm not here to upset anybody or to claim things about the game that I might have misinterpreted or things about the game that are, that are good that I may have embellished as well. I am planning a larger video for God of War Ragnarok. I know I said the same thing with The Last of Us Part 2 and I ended up not making that video. Um, There's always the five year later though, which I will do that for. But I do plan to do one for Ragnarok. I really, really do because there's a lot more to talk about than just analysing the story and the themes and the character arcs. There is the exploration, the combat, the general gameplay, the world design. There's so much more to it that I would love to jump into in a well-structured video. But I think I have to make this one where I sit down and discuss the way that I feel now initially so that I can collect my thoughts for a proper video down the line where everything I say is a lot more concrete and backed up with some sort of evidence as well. Now, I believe the general reception of Ragnarok has been positive. I believe it has been. There's been a bit of a discussion online about the way that characters will feed you puzzle solutions and things like that and just like point out obvious things in combat and uh, things along those lines that I think a lot of people have been quite annoyed by, which is, is reasonable. Uh, a lot of people have said there's certain sections of the game that are a bit too long, such as the bit in Ironwood with, with the yak, um, which, you know, fair enough, I suppose. But I, I feel there is, there, is, there is an issue with this game more at its core than anything else. Um, and over this video, I kind of want to talk about the things that I definitely have issues with, but also things that I think were actually very good too, um, and see where we can get. Now, I just put out a retrospective on God of War 2018, which I think is one of the best games ever made. So that's where I stand on God of War. I love the original trilogy. I think they're really, really, really good games in terms of their gameplay, story, themes, character, like every, they're really, really good. I love those games. I think that God of War 2018 is one of the best games ever made. I think it's a natural progression from those. The way that it uses its story, its characters, its world building, its lore, the mythology, the general exploration, the combat, the side content, and all of the, the main cast of characters and locations you visit makes God of War 2018 this beautifully perfected, cohesive experience where every single feature of the game feeds into each other. And I think that's just wonderful and that's why I love it so much. Something I've been saying when, when comparing it to Ragnarok is that if God of War 2018 is, you know, highbrow cinema, like, w you know, one of the best movies you've ever seen. You know, we're, we're talking, you know, Schindler's List, we're talking, you know, Citizen Kane, we're talking, you know, Shawshank Redemption, you know, like, you know, the, 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 the movies, you know what I mean. If God of War is one of those, which I'm not saying that God of War is the same as those, I'm just saying if we're saying that God of War 2018 is one of those sorts of films. Let's just, let's equate the two and let's say that's where the, they are, you know, let's just say they're the same level. I would say that God of War Ragnarok is then more akin in film to a Avengers Endgame, Avengers Infinity War, probably more so Endgame. And, and that's sort of where I'm sitting with this, is that God of War 2018 to me feels like real highbrow cinema, like some of the best stuff you can see that's gorgeously directed, got the best actors, the writing is airtight and just conveys its themes in such a p perfected way. Whereas Ragnarok is a lot more, it's action. It's, it's, it's high concept um, and it's satisfying and there are conclusions, but it, it's not, you know, one of the all time greats of uh, in terms of, you know, when comparing it to 2018. And I think that's probably where I'm at on a basis. Now that might upset people, they might not be happy with that, um, but that's basically where I'm at currently. Now, one of the things that I feel is, is, is one of the more confusing parts of Ragnarok is the contextualization of its story. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that 
In 2018, we got a new take on God of War, right? It doesn't play or feel like God of War 1 through 3. It's got a different tone. It's got a different camera angle. It's got the the, the single camera shot. Um, it's, it's a lot more grounded, a lot more personal, a lot more introspective. And the way that that is set up allows for the story to progress. And, 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 and those things go hand in hand. Like I said before, everything about the game goes hand in hand to, to really convey this singular narrative purpose. Ragnarok uses the framework of 2018 so the 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 tone the vibe the camera angle the, the the general vibe of 2018 but it uses that to tell a story that feels a lot more in line with the god of war 3 for example which i find leaves the sort of the the, the genre of the game and the story they're trying to tell they're almost at a head with each other in the the story they're telling doesn't really work with the method they're using to tell that story because if you take the story of god of war 3 which is a brilliant story and you tell it through the lens of god of war 2018's structuring and framework you end up with something that feels a little bit strange and doesn't really gel together quite well. That's sort of what I feel we're getting with Ragnarok. It's like if you were to take the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones, but over the top of it you play completely unfitting music that just does not work. like an epic like action theme or something it's like it completely changes what the scene is trying to convey and it just doesn't get across the message that is clearly the director's vision and so you end up with a bit of a mess and i'm not saying that ragnarok is a mess i'm just saying there are elements to it that feel sloppier than 2018 felt they do this thing where over the course of the game they sort of try to tap into kratos's in a conflict. And what they do with the way the game is built is they'll make the combat incredibly gratuitous. Like you are, it is incredibly fun to fight a lot of the bosses in this game. It's very old school God of War in that sense where you're, you know, ripping people up, you know, you're fucking really tearing into these boss enemies and, you know, it's 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 brutal, it's fucked, it's, it's, but, it, but it's good and the way that it's framed is, it's not framing it as a negative, right? It's framing it as gratuitous, not as an awful act. But, but at the same time, the, the narrative will condemn those things, and it's trying to say that Kratos slipping back into his old self is actually a bad thing, but then when you're playing, it's really fun. And I just think those things don't gel well together. And I've seen the, the, the argument that, well, a lot of people said that about The Last of Us, that playing The Last of Us 2 is really fun, but the story's trying to say that violence is bad. I, I disagree. I feel that The Last of Us, the way that it frames its combat, is in a way that is quite horrific, is quite awful. Is it's it, You feel like you're committing heinous acts when you kill people in The Last of Us Part 2, at least that's how it feels for me, because the focus is always on the reaction of the person committing the killing and the person who's being killed. It's on that visceral reaction of desperation and, and pain and, and agony and, 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 and fear. Whereas in God of War Ragnarok, the focus in terms of combat is always on how fucking cool is it that Kratos is doing this shit, which is right that's what god of war should be about but then it does feel that the, the the narrative itself is almost at odds with that and it feels a bit misplaced sometimes one of the major times i feel was with the heimdall boss fight you've got it's great it's like yes this is what we play god of war for it's kratos killing gods i absolutely love this and it's like they need an excuse to fight a god so they make one that is so one note and and just completely evil just like completely the opposite of what Baldur was in god of war 2018 but then at the end of the fight you have mimir go oh brother i can't believe you did that and it's like that was supposed to be mimir and it's 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 an odd one because I'm sitting here like, I get what the narrative is trying to say, and I think it makes sense as a progression from 2018, definitely. The narrative is definitely where it's supposed to be going, but the way that the gameplay is not feeding into that narrative harms the narrative itself, and it leaves me feeling conflicted, where I'm like, I am really enjoying fighting these gods. Like, you fight Thor at the end, I'm like, this is fucking fun as fuck. And then Kratos is like, I won't kill you, and it's like, yeah, that makes sense narratively, but... 
after a big battle like that, it does feel a bit dissatisfying. You know what I mean? I, it, it feels like there's a confliction between... Confliction? Is that a word? It feels like there, there, there is this conflict between the narrative and the, and, the, and the contextualization through gameplay and stuff. And another aspect of that is, I feel, the exploration. In 2018, the exploration is a characterization of Atreus and his want to go out, explore, see new things, have unique experiences. And you get that those moments to really bond with Kratos and Atreus, where you get to see their takes on what they're doing kratos has the you know the efficiency of a soldier he wants to go get more loot get more gear he wants to help people but not to help them just to get things whereas atreus is trying to teach him that no sometimes it's worthwhile to have these experiences and to help people because it builds you as a human being and that's important and that's the way the exploration is contextualized and it really feeds into the story in god of war ragnarok i genuinely feel the game would have benefited from being a linear experience with maybe exploration as an end game thing because i found the exploration to be a lot more fun once you finish the story i feel that despite the exploration being really good and very strong in terms of its gameplay the open world sections that you can visit in this game whether it's midgard alfheim svartalfheim uh, vanaheim whatever it might be, they're really good. There's some ones that are just like top tier, absolutely incredible. And at the lower end, it's just like really fun. Um, and I think it, they, they, they really built on the gameplay design of God of War 2018 in doing so, but I don't think it plays into the narrative in an incredibly well executed way. And so I'm left feeling a bit like, oh, I don't know, because all of the times when you can go explore, other than a few towards the start, it kind of feels like the characters are saying, Oh, we could just put off the main story for a bit if you want. Don't you miss the three of us out finding our own adventures? Putting off the inevitable. Exactly! And it's like the main story is finally taking the fight to Odin because he could be preparing for battle and might kill all of us. And it's like, ah, uh, no, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that makes sense there. Whereas in God of War 2018, it would be, well, we could go to Tyr's temple and put in the rune and continue our journey to the top of a mountain to spread some ashes or we could go over to this other island and see what's over there and it's like those seem similar tasks you know like it doesn't feel like it's ever out of place to do exploration in 2018 whereas in Ragnarok it feels like uh, more often than not uh, why am I doing this it, it feels a bit out of place and unnecessary and almost like the exploration exists not to facilitate story and to enhance the story but because you explore in God of War now. You, that's just a thing you do now in God of War because it was in 2018, so it's in Ragnarok 2. Whereas in 2018, it worked to enhance and, and, and contextualize the story. Here, it feels like it takes away from that aspect. Um, and I think it, it, it works to make it a bit of an issue. And in doing so, I think we end up with an odd pacing to the game. A pacing that I feel confuses the core themes of the game. In terms of its pacing, I mean, let's talk about my issues, because my issues are not with the the moments themselves, right? Like, I think, if at any point in this video I talk about the writing being bad, I'm not talking about the actual substance of the scenes when you get a cutscene, because I think 95% of those are terrific. They are wonderfully executed they're wonderfully directed they are written very nicely wonderful performances they're really really great and i think that the, the the direction of the narrative and the story beats themselves is exactly where they should have gone to it makes perfect sense there is nothing in terms of the than the there is nothing in terms of the beat to beat story that is wrong like you talk about Kratos wanting to prepare Atreus, it makes perfect sense. Atreus wanting to be independent and go off on his own, he's curious about what it means to be Loki and what that means for him, it makes perfect sense. Him having this, there's this wedge driven between him and his father, that makes perfect sense. Them eventually coming together again, that makes perfect sense. The ending of the game and how it all ends off, you know, Atreus going off on his own and, 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 and Kratos feeling this sense of, you know, now he's finally come to terms with who he is and, and, and yes, it was wrong to kill Heimdall because he always has a choice, like, it, it makes sense and all of those scenes are really really good there's so many terrific scenes in this game that just had me in tears and it was brilliant and it, I, I loved that about it but what i feel is that the space in between those main story beats don't seem to entirely flow properly now one of the major reasons for this i feel is the game's pacing moves at a breakneck speed it feels like the game is just jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing because there's so much in this game that it feels they needed to cram in in a way this game does start to feel like two games in one game 
it feels like they definitely could have got a trilogy, I think, out of this Norse period, because the game will, at points, feel like it's just absolutely racing along, and the, the, the leaps they make in some of the character arcs feel like leaps. They feel very, like, large, like they could have spent a lot more time fleshing them out, developing them, taking quite a while over the course of a game to develop a character arc to then lead into the third game in the trilogy. Whereas this game has to cram everything in at once, so it's like, well, we need this arc completed, so let's just speed it on up. And the way they speed it up is sometimes by having characters just talk out of character and spout exposition to one another, so they can change their mind and go on an arc and then be completed and move on to the next major story beat that is big and grand and bombastic and it, it starts to get a bit strange. You get the things like the companions speeding you through puzzles because it's like the game doesn't want you to linger. It's like, no, we've got to get to the next thing. Now we've got to go to the next thing. Then we've got to get to the next thing. And it happens in gameplay and it happens in the story itself. It feels like anytime there's not a cutscene playing out, the game goes, right, time to race to the next cutscene. And then when you get to the cutscene, it slows down, you get a nice scene, and then let's race to the next cutscene. And, and and that's very strange, because in God of War 2018, you'd come out of a poignant cutscene and it'd be like, let's meander for an hour. Let's just wander around. You know, maybe you don't even come across any enemies. You have a conversation with Atreus and Kratos. Like, halfway up the mountain, you come across a little lantern. And Atreus just lights it. He lets it go. There's this nice little moment. And then you move on walking through the cave, and it's nice. In God of War Ragnarok, it feels like you get this wonderful character moment. And then it's like, right, what's the plan? What do we do next? Where are we going? We've got to go to Alfheim? All right, let's go to fucking Alfheim. And now, now what are we going to do? Oh, Atreus is running away? Oh, fuck, now we're in fucking Asgard. And now we've got to be, go, now we've got to become friends with fucking Odin. Oh, now we're looking for pieces of a mask. And oh, now, now, now we're back and, and, and he's back and he, we're friends again. But oh, we've got to go stop Garm because he's tearing holes in things. And, and now we're back again. And oh, well, Tyr is actually Odin? Well, what's going on? Like, it, it just keeps going and going and going and going. The story itself, unless you purposefully take time to just linger and go off and do some 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 side content which feels a little bit out of place you're not going to get these moments of levity where you're just chilling out and i think you do get those moments don't get me wrong they are in the game M more so at the beginning of the game than at the back end of the game but they're very sparing and it feels like the game just doesn't want to linger for too long however Sometimes the game does want to linger for too long, and it feels like they're padding the game out. Somehow the game feels bloated, yet also rushed at the same time. You'll get, like I described, all of these moments, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. But also, you spend three hours riding a yak sometimes, and it's like, Jesus Christ, what is going on? Like, it feels like the game is constantly, it's this push and pull between... It feels like different writers. It feels like there was a lot of writers on this game, and I believe there was. I believe this game had something like six, seven writers, something like that, maybe more, whereas God of War 2018 had three writers, and it felt like there was much more of a core vision. And I think that this game is struggling to balance the slow, methodical, meandering story that they want to tell with cramming the events of what could have been two games into one game. And it ends up with this really odd pacing that sometimes feel like arcs are being rushed, sometimes it feels like arcs are being drawn out, and you end up very lost in this story at times where you just don't really know what they're doing, what's the purpose, what's the point, and where are we going with this, and then the game's over, and you're like, it's over, it happened. But what, like, I never felt like it landed on 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 a on a purpose or on a direction it felt like it was always flitting from thing to thing um and i think a lot of that is probably brought out by the fact you're switching quite continuously between atreus and kratos a lot of atreus's story feels like the main story i mean i think i, I don't think i would be wrong in saying that a majority of this game is the the the, the character arc of atreus more so than the character arc of Kratos, although it is very important, the character arc of Kratos is important, um, and it is, you know, it is a major part of the game, but I do think that Kratos' arc is more of an extension of what where we left him in 2018, whereas Atre Atreus' is, is, is new, it's something new, a new journey for him to go on. And in doing that, I feel that Atreus and his story needs more time to play out, to get to the ending where we are. Kratos's though needs less time and so what ends up happening with them sharing the spotlight and obviously they want you to play as Kratos more because they don't want to make a God of War game where you play as Kratos for 30% it would be bad but the way the story is written it feels like Atreus needs more time we need to spend more time with Atreus than we spend in this game because the times we do spend with Atreus for the most part other than Ironwood are moving at breakneck speed 
Whereas you, you, when you're playing as Kratos, it feels like these are things that we don't need to spend as much time on all of the time. And it feels like those things are being, it feels things that could be a lot quicker are being drawn out other than the section in Vanaheim. So it's kind of like, for the most part, that's how I view it. Although there are moments where it feels reversed, where Ironwood should have been shorter. Vanaheim's arc that we see with Freya and Kratos should have been more. That should have been more of the game. Not necessarily in Vanaheim but Freya's arc should have taken longer to progress because it feels a little bit rushed and I, I do just think that's a bit it's, it's it harms the game one of the things that I couldn't figure out when I first finished it was what the core theme of the game is so like when you play God of War 2018 the core themes are family and not letting your past be in control of you anymore um and those themes are very clear, and every single part of the narrative plays into those themes. But when I finished God of War Ragnarok, I couldn't point out a core theme of the game. I couldn't figure out what the game was trying to say to me, what message it was leaving. And I think, after lots of discussion on Discord, with mainly Flash, the, 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 the core theme of this game is the theme of choice. And what choice can mean and the impacts that it can have on people, relationships, and the outcome of events. I don't know whether it's the strongest theme I've ever seen in a game if that is indeed the core theme because it, it it i mean there's only so much you can explore on the topic of choice whereas the topic of your past and your mistakes and your regrets and your guilt and anxieties and and and, and how that plays into your family you know relationships with your son like that's that's a, that's a lot more depth to it uh in terms of the, the this 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 theme of choice i feel that the game does consistently bring it up all the time there's this theme that the kratos stole the choice from freya and that by giving her the choice back to make the choice to not kill him she chooses to not kill him you've got odin's choice to continue pursuing this 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 inevitable downfall that he has that's going to rip his whole life apart in in terms of this mask where he's like choosing to consistently go after it you've got giving atreus this choice between atreus and loki um and between his mother and his father's like heritage basically and him him having to try and choose and that's characterized by the choice between asgard or kratos sort of thing at the midpoint of the game and obviously these constant reoccurring themes of prophecy which i'll talk about a little bit later as well and i do think that those are done really well and it's obviously you know you get to this end point and it shows that a Kratos did not need to kill Heimdall. He had the choice not to, but he did it anyway because he felt that he had no choice but to regress into the person he used to be. And by the end of the game, he realizes actually, no matter how bad you are, no matter how wrong you've done, you can always do better. You can always do better. He doesn't just have to teach his son to be better, he can be better. And everyone can see him as better too and he will redeem himself and so he makes that choice and there's that parallel with thor like thor finally gets the choice obviously he dies for it i'm not sure what that means or why that happens i mean probably just get him out of the picture so odin's like evil and then you kill him i guess i don't know um you obviously got like sindri choosing not to tell brock the truth and then sindri choosing to to, to stay mad at atreus in the end um, and how that rips apart their bond because of a choice made that didn't need to be made. And, and it does feel like that is really what the game is trying to get at here. And the side quests even play into it too. You've got things like uh, in Svartalfheim, you've got Mimir wanting to... Even though he did this thing a long time ago and he could just move on from it and just move away, he chooses to, to shut down the machines in Svartalfheim. He chooses to free the creature... And he chooses to be better in a moment where he didn't have to do that. He'd already, you know, he's with a bunch of people that don't really care about his past. You know, you can move on from your past and you can just do, you know, whatever you want. But you have to choose to make it right. You can't just choose to forget about something. You have to then choose to make it right as well. And I think that works. And it, it, is, it is a main theme of the game. I just don't know how well it's conveyed and explored over the length of the game. Because it does feel like there's also so much going on in the background that... It almost gets it almost gets drowned out by all of the bombastic and grandiose things that are happening in the story. That you almost feel like the game is not trying to get across this theme, although it is consistently there as well. I think is probably how I feel about that aspect. I don't know. Now, in terms of the writing itself, I I have issues with with the writing quality. Um, I don't feel that it's always bad. Um, by no means, and I think on the whole, like most of it is good. Um but 
God of War 2018 is a game that tells its story with the most subtle of dialogue and writing. It conveys all of its core themes, its messages, and its character arcs in a way that doesn't need to be pointed out to you. However, along the same lines of the characters pointing out the puzzles to you, the story often likes to point out the story to you. It doesn't seem to treat you like you have a brain, it seems to treat you like you're probably an idiot that doesn't get it, and so it's got to like point it out. Like I said before, the mission with the creature in Spartalfheim with Mimir is good for the core theme, but the way that it's handled in terms of its actual writing I don't think is great, because you have this moment where they're walking around this this creature talking about it, it it's like, oh, this, like, it, it's implied that, oh, this, this is a parallel to Mimir being chained up, and he understands that, so he wants to right his wrongs, because after being locked up by Odin, can feel what this creature feels, and so it's meaningful for him to release it. But but then he just says it out loud, and it's like... And I didn't know what it was like to be chained in one place for years at a time, with nothing to occupy your mind but pain. Yeah, dude, I knew that. I got it. I, it was, it, I could infer that. It was heavily implied. You don't just have to say it out loud like I'm an idiot. And I feel like this type of writing is, is littered throughout this game. One of the major things that I think is probably the worst part of the game, and the, 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 the least well handled, is Freya's arc. I believe that it's very odd that she's like it was very compelling where you leave her in 2018 it's like okay so how is this going to play into god of War ragnarok because this is very interesting and cory barlock even said in an interview you're not even going to guess where freya's story is going so it's like okay that's interesting how are they going to handle this but it turns out what they do is she wants to kill kratos until she sees him be nice to his son once and then she goes ah uh, maybe not and yeah, it's not as simple as that, it's not as cut and dry, but it is basically that, because from that moment I knew, there was no doubt in my mind, oh, she's, we're going to be mates again. We're obviously going to be mates again at the end of this, because she becomes a companion, you go to Vanaheim, they're just bantering between each other, they're just having conversations, like you get straight to Vanaheim, she's immediately telling you the history of the marketplace there, it's like, you want to, do you not want to kill me? Why, why are you telling me the history and lore of your people? Like... It seems completely out of place. Sometimes if you die in Vanaheim, Freya will just like scream out, Kratos, no! It's like, I thought you wanted to kill me. You haven't completed your arc yet. What is that? That seems so odd and out of place. The major thing that changes Freya's mind is Kratos telling her about his his daughter and his family that he killed back in Greece. And I just think that's very out of character for Kratos. I don't understand why he would unprompted tell Freya, who wanted to kill him, his entire life story about Deimos, about his daughter and about his wife, about his deal with Ares, about all of these things that he keeps so tightly guarded, it feels very out of place. And you might say, well, you know, after the end of the after the end of 2018, he's a lot more open now. But he is not. He's not. That's not where we left him at the end of 2018. And it's not how they characterize him at the start of Ragnarok either. Especially at this point. By the end of Ragnarok, yes, he's probably in a position where he might do that. Especially for someone that he feels close to. But they also play up the relationship that Freya and Kratos had in 2018. Kratos is like, we were friends. It's like, you weren't really. You weren't friends. You shrugged her off at every opportunity. You didn't trust her. You only really went to her because your son trusted her. You weren't friends at all. Like, not even close to friends. Like, that di that's not the case. So I find that very odd. It just doesn't feel to me like something Kratos would do. I just do not buy it. I don't believe it. And I think it's, uh, I think it's uncharacteristically explored. Because I think he, he is just, at that point, spouting exposition so that they can get Freya to go, Ah... Oh. I guess you are the victim. I guess, I guess I was wrong the whole time. I, I guess we're mates again, right? And it's like, all right, that's not very. I don't find that very compelling. I really don't. I that, I would say that is probably the weakest part and the one that, without a doubt, the part that, without a doubt, I can say is the worst part of the game. I genuinely think it's handled quite poorly, um, and I'm not a huge fan of that. That being said, Vanaheim is really good in terms of its side content. I will say that. Both sections that you can explore in Vanaheim, both the crater and the um, like the river valley area, are both really, really good. And Freya's side quest there is wonderful. It's probably one of the best parts of the game, um, which is really funny, because in contrast with her arc in the main story and her arc in the side content, so, so good. You've got this wonderfully implied um, parallel to Kratos' story. It's 
brilliant. They never point it out. It's just there for you to see. Like, that sword is clearly her Blades of Chaos. She's trying to push her past away and hide it and hide her links to Asgard. When really, by the end, she learns, no, I need to lay into this. This is, it's it's who I am. It's a part of me. And I can take that and I can take back my own destiny with it. And then it again plays into that theme of choice, which I think is just really, really good. And I wish that her arc was all like that in the main story. And with that, I think it brings us to the topic of prophecy, which is a major part of this game. Now, this is something that has really left me confused because I've just felt that the prophecy is not clearly outlined in a way that allows it to be the driving force of the game, because it is the driving force of the game. The murals at the end of 2018 set up this idea that Faye knew the whole journey thus far. Now, she destroyed the final mural. Why is that? Well, we don't actually learn that she did it until the end of this game. We, so someone destroyed it. It was destroyed. It was lost. What, how? Why? Hmm, who knows? Will Kratos die? I don't know. Now being able to enter the murals or the, 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 the lore panels, whatever you call them, that, that are around the world, it allows you to go in and see the true history or the true prediction or the true prophecies from the giant, um, which is, again, a driving force of this game. It sets up things like Ragnarok, like Tyr. It sets up the champion of the Jotnar, which we will get back to because that's a whole other thing. This whole game is propelled by prophecy. Atreus's arc is propelled by the the mural that he finds in Ironwood, which is the completed, the finished mural that was in Jotunheim that we see destroyed. So he gets to see, you know, he always oh, becomes friends with Odin. His father dies. Thor is there. Um, you've got the 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 what we find out is actually a soul transfer, but I mean, it looked like a snake, and I, I don't know. It, it's a bit weird. It feels like they changed things mid development. I don't really know. But there's this idea of fighting back against your own destiny because that's what Atreus really desperately wants to do. His father is saying you don't need to worry about any of that. We do what we do because we have to, not because it is written. It's a thing they say over and over and over again. Angra Boda reinforces that that, that that it is inevitable. She genuinely believes in the prophecy, um, which is just another reason for for Atreus or Loki to fight against it um, and really try his best because he is just so scared for his father dying. Uh, the Norns also confirm this and their method of prophecy is said to be based on predictability, but they also in that scene say what the main characters are saying as they're saying it, and so I don't really know if it is based on just like pure predictability and all that you have to do is do something uncharacteristic of yourself to for them not to know that you're going to do it. I... I that, I don't know if that makes sense. I don't, that just doesn't feel like it makes sense to me. That all of their prophecy is just based on, well, we know you really well. So we know what you're going to say. And you will die because that's just who you are. And Kratos decides at the last moment, what if I just like act like not myself? What about that? And then the Norns are like, shit, I couldn't have seen that coming. It's like, what? So what's the point of prophecy then? I don't really understand, especially when it is the driving force of the game. Prophecy is something that is reinforced again and again, that it's something that's important throughout this game. Kratos, like I said, simply chooses not to die, which is a fucking brilliant moment, by the way. I absolutely love that section where he's like, I'm wrong, like, no, open your heart. Oh, 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 so good. It was so good. Uh, and what that tells us, I believe, is that prophecy is not concrete, as everyone else believes it to. So the murals actually mean nothing in the end. What really matters is the choices you have. If you fall back into who you always are, yes, it's going to be predictable and people are going to be able to write these prophecies about you. But if you choose to be better and you really choose to change, then you can do that and you can break free of the prophecy. I believe that's what it's trying to say. But the thing is, Faye also destroyed the mural in 2018 specifically so they'd break free from fate. So the murals actually are still important and could still happen. What is prophecy based on and where does it come from? If it's if it's always true except for this one time, what altered th this one? I I don't I don't understand why this specifically changed unless you're genuinely not seeing the future. But Atreus sees the future because he sees Thor show up, that's actually the future. That's not based on predicting, like, someone's core character traits. Like, he, like because Atreus knows what Thor is like, he could see that he would come to their house, I guess? Like, exactly as it happens in a dream? But, like, I, I don't know. It feels like prophecy, like the future, like they're seeing the future, right? I don't really know. And in that case, what was the thing that was able to change it? Was it really just choosing to change... Was it really just choosing to change it? 
that seems crazy, especially when there's a core thread throughout this game, and Kratos talks about it, that sometimes when someone tries to defy prophecy, they actually make it happen. So what about those people that choose to defy prophecy, and it still happens? I guess there isn't a choice? I don't really know. And where does the choice come from without outside intervention? I suppose it's supposed to be the dreams that he keeps having of Faye. But then that begs the next question of, how did that, where did they come from? Kratos says after the first one that it's more than memory. That's what he says to Mimir. But then that's never touched upon again. And it only feels like more than memory in the very first one. The rest just feel like dreams, like memories. Like he's just remembering something happening and those are poignant. And so they affect his character as he moves forward at, at the right point. So it's like, you know, the first time he's not quite ready and he's trying to shut it out. And then during the middle of the game, he he falls back on who he used to be and he doesn't listen to the, to the memories. And then right at the very end, he gets another memory and he's like, this time I'm going to listen. I'm going to play into what Faye wanted of me and I'm gonna change and he does but I don't understand how these are these are they just memories or is Faye doing this to him because he says it's more than memory so is it or is it not it's never explored and I just find that to be very strange it feels like it was just left never to be touched on again and talking about things that were dropped in the story there are a few of these things that were dropped in the story things like who blew the horn when we were taking Atreus to Freya's to, to heal him when he was sick? Who who blew, blew the serpent's horn? We don't know. A lot of people have said that it's just um, Galahorn. Like, but no. How could it be that? People have been like, well, it transcends time. Which, okay, first of all, that's never stated. Second of all... If it did transcend time, why did it specifically only blow at that one moment in God of War 2018 three years ago? Why? Why? That doesn't make any sense. Because if it transcended time and just it echoed through all of time, it would be... It would be... You'd hear it always. So that doesn't make sense. How did it choose just to blow the horn at that one time in 2018 three years ago? But also, why? Because... Nobody comes through from 2018. I know I know a lot of people have like misunderstood the Jormungandr thing. It's the Jormungandr that shows up during the Ragnarok is the Jormungandr that, that um, Atreus puts the giant soul into during Ironwood. Thor then sends it back in time to eventually be the Jormungandr we meet in 2018. So the Jormungandr, the modern Jormungandr that we meet in 2018 that lives through when it is in Ragnarok, he doesn't join us during the events of Ragnarok. He just hangs out i guess in midgard midgard i don't i don't really know there's the champion of the yacht now which i said earlier is set up when you go into one of the murals and that never comes up again it's suggested by both i mean tear keeps calling well, not really but tear keeps calling atreus the guardian of the yacht now um angraboda says it odin says it so like those characters are reinforcing that atreus is the guardian of, is the champion of the yacht now right but then you've got Freya and Mimir both seem to think that it's Kratos when you're in the Kratos section. So it's this it's this mystery of like, hmm, which one is it? It could apply to both. It could apply to neither. It could apply to either. I wonder. But then it just never comes up again. And it's not my problem that it's left up to interpretation. I think that's fine. But the game never reinforces that you should be interpreting it. Because it, it just drops it. It just never comes up again. They just don't mention it again or ever say it again. And so it's like okay, what was the point then? Because the game is not even suggesting that I should be thinking about it. It's just dropped it and just stopped mentioning it out of nowhere. So why did you bring it up in the first place? Because it doesn't seem to really mean anything. I think it's odd that, that Tear just sort of it exists to be not real. And it's like, he's there throughout the whole game being useless. And he was the instigator for the whole thing. And then it's like, well, he was actually Odin the whole time. And it's like, he exists just to be a plot twist. He doesn't offer anything of value for the whole game until it's like, oh, he's a plot twist. And then it's like, oh, okay, there you go. All right. And, you know, Tyr does show up again in, in a side quest in Nibelheim. And I don't know if I like that too much because he also then has no depth to him either. He's just like alive to be alive. And it's like, well, yeah, all right, he's alive. Cool. But it doesn't. he doesn't do anything or say anything important. It's just, There's not a lot of depth there, you know what I mean? It just feels a bit surface level, a bit shallow. The World Serpent as well is totally sidelined. Like I said, like, you know, what happened to the one in Midgard? I don't really know. Like, he he just he just shows up once to tell Atreus Ironwood, and that's it. <laughs> and, and all right, cool, that's it. I thought there'll be more to him because they do set up this, 
oh, he recognizes the kid. Like, he recognizes Atreus. And it's like, okay, there's going to be more depth to this. But it just turns out, like, it's just, like, a random giant soul that he put into, like, a random dead snake and then, like, saw for five seconds before it slithered away. And it's like, okay, so they have no connection at all. There's absolutely nothing there about them at all. There's nothing. <laughs> I, like, come on. I'm not being too harsh, am I? This is so weird. <laughs> I will say the other, the one thing that is dropped that I think works is the mask. It's, it's dropped because it should be dropped because it plays into those core themes that it doesn't matter. Like, the, the mask, the truth of the mask doesn't matter. What's behind the realm tear doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it means to be, you know, Loki. Atreus figures it out himself. He he decides who Loki is. It's not something that's written and it's it's a choice to make, right? So it plays into those core themes again, and I think it's done really well. I would like to know what was behind the, the realm tear. I, I will say, like, I did feel a bit disappointed because I, I did think it was a very interesting mystery. And so it's, it's, I'm struggling because, like, yeah, th finding out what was behind the realm tear would not have played into the core themes. And so I get it. They couldn't have done it. Like, it makes actually way more sense narratively for it to be locked away. And, like, you're never going to find out. Yes, I get that because it, you know, it's part of, like, Odin's story. Like, it, yes, it makes sense. I get it. But I also, I found it really interesting and it, it was a bit of a shame but I, I like i think that it's for the best that they did that so i'm cool with that i'm cool with that show them restraint you're doing well that's good but uh jesus i don't think there's anything else i want to talk about i think those are the main things i wanted to bring up i didn't mean for this video to be as negative as it maybe has come across um it's i think it's that if i didn't mention something i probably thought it was good you gotta think these are the things that i thought were issues and they're the things that have been playing on my mind whereas the, everything that i didn't mention i probably thought it was really good um so just keep that in mind like you know there's so many scenes i didn't talk about in this video i thought they were good also i didn't think ironwood was that bad i i will say i don't think it was that bad i think the pacing was a bit weird in comparison to the rest of the game but i think that's because so much of the game runs so quick it was like it was so nice to just have three hours of just meandering which is what i feel the game should have been you know it's it's a lot more similar to 2018 in that way so there's that but th i mean there is a lot that i loved about this game like i love just playing it i love just exploring all the little conversations between characters i i I think the combat system is really strong. I, I love the side quests. I love the side stories. Um, I love the world design. Um, the soundtrack is amazing. Uh, there's so many brilliant scenes. The performances are fantastic. Um, there's so there's so much. There's so much good stuff here. There really, really is. And it's, it's uh, the one thing I will say that I'm relieved is good is the conclusion of this story. I, I think it's perfect, I think. Other than, like, I, I if I'd have written this story, maybe I would have had Kratos die, and I would have had Kratos die in a way that mirrors the story of Atreus of Sparta, and then, because of his death, though, his son is better, becomes a better person. Maybe that's something I would have done, but I actually quite like what they did here, in that Kratos doesn't just decide we need to be better, he decides I can choose to be better now. Like, I'm not gonna, you know... I'm not just going to rely on my son to be the better better person. I am going to be better. Like, I'm not going to kill Thor right now. I'm not going to kill these innocent people. We are going to save them. We're going to do the right thing. And it's like, actually, this moment where, like, actually, this is heroic. Like, that's 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 a really good morally, like, that's a really morally good thing for, for him to do. Um, and it, I really, really liked that. And I thought that worked really, really well. And Atreus going off and doing his own thing. Like, it was, it was really nice. It was just like, the game's ending was really, really nice. And... I, I, I'm just, I'm just like thankful that, that the core beats of the story are really good. I think I'm just a little bit disappointed that the game isn't on the level of 2018 where it's like near perfect. I think that's just where, I think that's just how I feel. Because I feel that Ragnarok is as good as Ghost of Shima. Uh, better, better than Ghost, I think it's better than Ghost of Shima. I think it's probably as good as Horizon Forbidden West um, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. It's just, I feel that God of War 2018 was in another league to most video games um the it feels odd that ragnarok is not in that league you know what i mean like if they're like if we're saying ghost of shima spider-man ps4 horizon whatever uh, uh you know s tier games this is an s tier game it's just god of war 2018 red dead redemption 2 uh persona 5 royal they're s plus tier games you know what i mean just a tier above s tier i feel like and so that's why i'm a little bit you know it's, it just, it feels a bit disappointing. It's a bit of a shame that this wasn't better than 2018, or at least as good as it. Um, and so I just feel a little bit disappointed in that sense, which is why I guess I'm focusing on the negatives, because everything else that was done well, was done well. And I'm like, 
you know, that stuff was good. And when I make a video on it, I can talk about those things in detail. But the things that are standing out to me are the things that weren't done well because I didn't feel like this about 2018. So I think that's probably why I feel the way that I do. What I want is I want your thoughts. I really, really do. I'll be reading the comments. I know there's going to be a lot of mean comments. People are going to be like angry with me for feeling this way. I'm sorry. I hope that I like articulated how I feel um, as well as I can. But I do want your input. If you think I if you think I've misinterpreted something or that I've missed out on something important, let me know. I would I really want to hear your feedback and like try to make like convince me like convince me of like something that I didn't like that actually maybe I should like. Um, and but don't just say like because like I feel like a lot of people try to convince based on like their own inference like. But but it's not like you're, it's not like actually implied by the game. A lot of people just make things up so that it makes sense in their head. They're like, well, it could have been this. It's like, but it, the game doesn't say that, so that's not it, right? Like, I don't know. My brain works fucking weird. I'm, but I just want to know what you guys think. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know your analysis. Let me know your critiques. Let me just know where you're at mentally with this game because I would like to do it. Um, I do want to do a spoiler-focused discussion like this over on Twitch in the coming like week or so. Uh, once more people have finished the game, I'd love to just sit down on stream, just talk it out with everybody. So give me a follow on Twitch, the link is in the description, um, and hopefully we'll do that soon. We can just sit down, talk about God of War Ragnarok, get it all out, have like one or, like actual conversations so like, people in chat can address me there and then, and we can like discuss it, which is a lot easier than comment sections, um, but I wanted to make this um, to be able to get it all out there in, like, a condensed way so that I've said it and, like, I've collected my thoughts. It just, it's just like therapy. It's just like therapy. And hopefully in the new year after the advent calendar, which, by the way, the form is out for now. I'll link that in the description too. If you want to submit your ideas for the advent calendar, uh, this year, you can do. That's out now. Um, after the advent calendar, I will work on my Ragnarok video, um, and have, get something together. And hopefully, hopefully... I can get my thoughts collected and it works out. Anyway, thank you guys so much for joining me. Thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you all soon for something new. See you very soon for the advent calendar. And of course, we're still doing a lot of streams over on Twitch. So that is there. Anyway, thank you very much. And I'll see you all later on. Bye-bye. <laughs>